Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 653 of the podcast and it is Thursday the 3rd of November 2022 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking to children's author Ada Ari about her African language and storybooks, as well as how she publishes and markets in the USA, mostly direct to customers and in stores and schools. Ada is a new author and has built a fledgling business without knowing much of what a lot of indie authors take for granted. So it was so interesting to hear about the way she's doing things and also about her plans to grow and expand into more books and products for children. So that's coming up in the interview section. So in publishing and book marketing news, lots of news this week. (laughs) So I'm going to try and cover a lot of it. So you might remember all the juicy insights about publishing that came up during the Department of Justice case against Penguin Random House, PRH, taking over Simon & Schuster. That happened a couple of months ago and I talked about some of the things that came up then. Well, the ruling is in and the takeover has been blocked. Now, PRH will appeal, but if they don't take over Shyman and Schuster, the question is who will? Because the company is for sale, obviously, but if it's not another publisher because that will get blocked, then it'll be very interesting to see what happens. So that is still ongoing, but yeah, the ruling is in. It's also going off in audio. So the annual spoken word audio report came out this week from Edison. A few key things. 62% of the US population has listened to a podcast and 46% of the US population listen to spoken word audio daily. Again, year on year growth. And the time people spend listening to spoken word audio is increasing. And the percentage of of time listening to podcasts and audiobooks is increasing. So what does that mean to you? Well, when you're thinking about book marketing, how can you use audio to reach people who listen to podcasts and audiobooks? Well, of course, having your books available in audio is part of it, but also you can pitch podcasts that relate to the themes in your book as part of your book marketing. And um, obviously, it's something that I very much believe in. (laughs) in terms of uh, podcasting, but you don't need your own podcast. You can pitch other people for um, for doing that. So yeah, definitely consider how audio can be part of your book marketing. And still related to audio in a slightly different direction, Amazon Prime this week, as reported by TechCrunch, announced that Amazon Prime now comes with a full music catalogue of 100 million songs and ad-free podcasts. This is a huge move. (laughs) I mean, it is a direct shot at streaming music competitors, Spotify, obviously, Apple Music. And um, Spotify has been moving into the podcast market. Obviously, Apple has music and podcasts. So everyone having music and podcasts now. I mean, part of this is related to that Edison report. More and more people are listening to spoken word as well as expecting music streaming. So I think this is very interesting. And I'm interesting for a couple of reasons. One is I am an Amazon Prime member uh, for many reasons, mainly free shipping for all the books I still buy. (laughs) And also we watch Amazon Prime TV. And I am now questioning my monthly Spotify subscription for music. uh, And I'll still use Spotify because I like it for the discoverability on podcasts. But this is super interesting. And I imagine a lot of other people are going to question it too. Now, I, I love Spotify. I've talked about it before. But if I can get my podcasts and still get my music, (laughs) then that's interesting. And both Jonathan and I have our own subscription. So given everyone's tightening their belts at the moment, that is going to be interesting to a lot of people. But from the creator perspective, I wonder whether musicians and rights holders signed deals that underestimated the impact of Amazon Music on their revenues. So 
there was clearly no mass signing. I think it went from 2 million songs to 100 million songs. There is no way that 98 million songs, however many people that represents in terms of creators and rights holders, there's no way everyone just signed a new contract, a new licensing contract. What is more likely that happened was a change to the terms and conditions or uh, when you log in. I imagine it's exactly the same as how we use Amazon KDP or Audible is when we upload our content into these sites, we the terms and conditions are the contract. So it may well be that people said, yeah, great, let's do it. But how will this impact rights holders? And maybe... Prime is just marching in a direction of including a lot more stuff. Could that possibly include Kindle Unlimited and or Audible, which at the moment people pay extra for subscription? Now, Amazon Music, up till yesterday or whenever it was, uh, was a separate subscription. So this is very interesting. As ever, everything changes. (laughs) But I expect we're going to hear more from musicians about how this it will impact them, which is why, as I talked about last week, this sort of making sure you've got other income streams, the creative economy means not relying on any single uh, company because they can change things so quickly. Also, talking more of Spotify. So Spotify launched audiobooks. They bought Findaway uh, last year and tried to launch audiobooks in the USA, but that has come to a halt because of the way Apple's App Store works. And they basically can't sell with this a la carte model effectively, as reported in The Verge, as ever links in the show notes. Now, I'm keen to sell audiobooks through Spotify, so I would like them to sort this out. Um, But at the moment, you can see what's happening. We've got all these big platforms. I mean, Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Spotify, you know, these are some big players, all who are trying to get consumers to listen to podcasts, listen to audiobooks, listen to music through their system. And who controls the many of the devices? Well, that's Apple. Obviously, Google has some as well. And Google, I mean, Google, (laughs) Google also has all of their stuff in the Play Store, but they don't seem to be making too much of a fuss. So I think this is very, very interesting. Again, who knows how it's going to shake out. But uh, there were some things where Spotify was saying that it's not that different rules seem to be applying to Audible than to what Spotify wants to do. And so we may see changes if Apple apply that retrospectively. But again, (laughs) there's some big moves going on in audio. And then into social media, I have to mention Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter. Now, it doesn't matter what you think about it. It has happened. So there you go. And the business model of Twitter is changing, focusing more on subscription with Twitter Blue, offering more functions that are currently being fleshed out. Now, uh, lots of people moaning, obviously, about things changing and uh, Elon and all that. But I am very interested in this. Twitter has, I've been on Twitter since 2009. It's still my favourite and really the only social media platform that I engage in on a daily basis. I still find it super useful. I very much use curation. People say, oh, Twitter's just a cesspool. Well, it is if you listen to all that stuff, but you can use curation. So I use lists. I pretty much use lists and to segment what I, the people I want to actually listen to. Uh, and if you, I use TweetDeck and essentially... I don't hear all of that stuff. Like I don't do politics on Twitter, for example, <laughs> although you can't, it's hard to avoid it when Elon takes it over. But in terms of the the way he has addressed things, has said we can't be, we have to make some money for a start, which is true. It, Twitter has not made money. And how do we do this without just making another ad platform? And so the blue tick will be a subscription, which I am interested in because it will have different functions. One of them that they're talking about is the ability to post long form video and audio. Now, that's that to me would be valuable because... I'm a podcaster. And again, we're talking about audio. What if you could include a whole audio chapter in your tweets as part of your audiobook marketing? What if I can put my whole podcast out on Twitter? What does that mean? So again, the platform is changing. It was what, 140 characters back in the day, and then it changed that and everyone moaned about that. And now it might be moving more into a sort of multi 
uh, multimedia platform. So yeah, again, since many of us use Twitter, it means a change in the way that the social media platform works, maybe for the good, maybe for the worse, depending on your position. But the point is, as ever, everything changes and we just have to adapt to the changes. Uh, plus, as ever, do not build your whole business on someone else's platform as they can change the rules. <laughs> at any minute. That's true of all of these platforms that we use, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Amazon, Apple, Google, everyone. Uh, So make sure you have your own website and your email list. So when things change, you don't go under and your book sales don't disappear. And again, one of the reasons I built my Shopify store was to have another way of selling. And thanks to everyone who buys direct from my Shopify store, (laughs) creativepenbooks.com, because that income, as I've talked about many times, that goes straight into my bank account and bypasses all these other things. So yay. (laughs) And finally, still more in changes in social media this week. It's just gone off this week. I don't know what happened. (laughs) Facebook and Instagram are are introducing digital collectibles. Yes, NFTs. Uh, Sorry for those of you who hate hearing about NFTs, but then they're positioning them as digital collectibles. So um, across various blockchains, including Polygon and Solana, and coming on the back of the funding announcements by Book.io, by Ingram and the Bertelsmann Investment Company, this is another step towards digital collectibles heading toward mainstream adoption. So yes, you're going to have to hear more about this. (laughs) Now, I know many of you are still sceptical, but I hope you'll go back and listen to some of my earlier episodes on this and think about it. Uh, In this situation, this digital collectible idea is thinking about it as a way to show your identity online. So the same reason you might wear certain clothes or certain jewellery that says something about you, whatever you do to show aspects of, of your personality, digital collectibles will be like that. So you'll be able to show on your profile or in your page or whatever, uh, you know, instead of a board eight picture, which most of us don't care about, you have a limited edition digital collectible latest Stephen King book or the latest Colleen Hoover or, you know, a special edition gorgeous whatever from your favorite author and it's certainly one angle on nft so i mean i i think that's a really interesting idea the ever shifting landscape creatives and we just have to adjust but it uh, as ever i will keep sharing and keep trying to interpret this uh, for all of us So a quick personal update. And indeed, speaking of NFTs, (laughs) I'm actually recording this early as tomorrow, as I record this, I'm speaking at NFT London uh, on NFTs for books. And uh, when this goes out, I will have already spoken at the event. So it might be on Twitter or something, but certainly a different side of my brain to the pilgrimage book, which I am still writing. It's kind of swapping from a sort of spiritual, physical, <laughs> memoir type of writing into future stuff, which no longer feels that futurist, to be honest. So that's happening. Also, we are heading off this weekend to Cambridge, which if you don't know, the UK is over kind of on the other side from where I am of England. And we're going to pick up our two adopted new cats. They are British short hair cats, Cashew in Noisette, because their them, mummy is French and we're rehoming them. So yes, Cashew uh, and Noisette. And I will, of course, be posting pictures of them once they settle in. And this is a, obviously a big change. It's a real commitment. We last had a cat in Australia. And when we left Australia, we were kind of heartbroken. Shmi, we had to leave our cat Shmi behind. Uh, well, we rehomed him and he had a very happy time. Um, and uh, his mummy used to put pictures on Instagram. So I, I used to watch them and now I'll be doing the same. So we're, we're very excited. Jonathan and I, very excited to have uh, good cat energy in the house again. So yes, they will. If you're a cat person, there will be pictures. <laughs> Also, I've been preparing my slides for the workshop on your author business plan. And actually, it's really helping me because as part of it, I will be sharing some of my stuff for what's going to happen in 2023. Um, So that's I'm finding a good process for myself thinking of how we'll do the workshop. If you'd like to join me, the dates are the 9th, the 12th and the 27th of November 2022. And if you go to thecreativepen.com forward slash live, you can sign up for one of those. And it is £50 to come and join me. 
live. Right, so thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. Robert Thomas left a comment on the blog about Jennifer's episode on tropes. Really enjoyed this one. I used to be so obsessed with originality that I thought tropes were something to be avoided. It's very helpful to me to think of tropes as shortcuts that can quickly create an emotional experience for a reader that I can then build upon in my own way. It's another case of don't reinvent the wheel. Thanks, Jennifer and Joanna, for this discussion. Thanks also to to uh, Iman Hassan, who sent a lovely picture of an autumn river scene. And he said, listening to the latest episode during a walk in Fort Tryon Park, which looks lovely. And finally, Jen Cosgrove left a comment on the YouTube channel, said, I'm grateful for your episodes on AI and Web3. If I had not been listening to your podcast and the special Patreon episodes, I think I would have been confused and unsettled by the AI tools for writing and art that are now widely available or announcements from companies like Starbucks, Walmart, Fidelity, Visa and countless others now weaving crypto and NFT into their offerings. And you have gotten me excited about smart contract possibilities. Thanks for giving creatives ideas of how to surf the wave of new technologies and use them to our advantage. Thanks so much, Jen. What a difference a year makes, because this time last year, I was getting a lot of, uh, I mean, I still get uh, negativity and um, (laughs) negativity. comments (laughs) comments <laughs> let's say but this year I'm getting a lot more positive vibes like this one uh, where people are sort of uh, hearing about things in daily life now so it's not just me talking about this stuff it's lots of other things happening and hopefully you know as I said I'm going to keep sharing and uh, we shall surf the wave of change together so remember you can tweet me at the creative pen and send me pictures of where you're listening you can leave a comment on the blog or the youtube channel you can email me joanna at the creative pen.com i love to hear from you it makes this more of a conversation So today's show is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors and their team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help you reach new readers around the world. Kobo's author first approach is one of the reasons they developed a promotions tool. This is an easy and affordable way for you to market your book directly to Kobo readers. They offer lots of promotions that don't require you to drop your price because they know when you publish wide, it can be a pain to coordinate pricing across multiple retailers. Any promotions listed as a percent off, for example, 40% VIP sale, means you don't have to change your price as the discount will be provided by promo code at checkout. And uh, I'll just jump into the ad read to say I use this promotions tab every three weeks. I have a reminder that comes up on my things app, which is my like to do list. And it says go and submit to Kobo promotion. So every three weeks I go in and I submit my book to uh, my books on Kobo to everything I possibly can. And uh, some of the promotions are just free to submit to. Some of them you can pay to be involved in, but it's never that much. Um, And then, yeah, you either get accepted or rejected. And I get rejected and accepted just as much as anyone else. (laughs) But uh, going back into the ad read, it says, if that sounds good to you, keep an eye out for percent off promotions and buy more, save more sales where you can submit your titles and leave the rest to Kobo. And if you're taking part in a promotion, be sure to tell your readers about it. The promotions tool is updated on a weekly basis. So make sure you're taking a regular look to see what's on offer. And if there's an opportunity that matches your books and marketing plans, I should also add there's always lots of promotions for box sets, and mainly fiction as well. So if you have fiction box sets and you're wide, make sure you sort this out. If you're a KWL author and don't yet have access to the promotions tool, and if you log into KWL, well, there should just be a promotions uh, tab there. Email the team at writinglife at kobo.com and they'll enable it for you. If you want to learn more about Kobo Writing Life, check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast available wherever you get your podcasts and find them on social media. Create your free account today at kobo.com forward slash writing life. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating this show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. And if you become a patron of the show, you get an extra monthly Q&A where I answer lots of questions from patrons about everything to do with writing, publishing, marketing, future stuff, personal things. And of course, if you subscribe on Patreon, you can unsubscribe later on, completely up to you. And I 
and understand that uh, completely. So thanks to new patrons this week, Ingrid, Morlan, Leah A and Rasana Atreya. And thanks to everyone who's been supporting the show for months and years. You make sure this show continues, that's for sure. It means a lot to me financially and emotionally. <laughs> you can support the show and get the uh, Q&A audio as well as percentage off my courses at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Ada Ari is the author of books for children, including The Spider's Thin Legs and The Turtle's Crack Shell, as well as language learning books for African languages. So welcome, Ada. Thank you, Joanna. Oh, no, this is such an interesting topic. So first of all, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing in the first place. Sure. Well, I am a Nigerian immigrant to the United States. I moved here back in 1996 as a teenager with my family. And fast forward to now, I'm a parent with two young children. And when I started reading to them, I wanted them to also have some of the stories that I grew up on, some of our African folk tales. And I realized quickly that there was no way that I could share these stories with my young children if I didn't tell them myself. And they were so young that I felt they needed a picture book version of the story just for retention. Like that age of infancy and toddlerhood, they really need the pictures to go along with the stories for it to make sense. And so that's in brief my story. My children are my inspiration. Which I know a lot of people listening want to write books for children because of their own children. (laughs) So I think that that absolutely comes through with people. But why, I guess, growing up in Nigeria, you heard those stories. But why did you decide to focus that on doing it in a book? I mean, you could have retold them in a different way or come up with different stories. What is it about these stories that you care about so much? Before putting pen to paper, I was also thinking that it would be great to actually animate some of these stories or in general, just have more representation of Black characters in the different animated series that my children watched. But animation is a completely different beast altogether. And I happened to be reading a book when I just thought to myself, you know what, why not create these stories for my children? And the first book that I wrote was actually The Turtle's Crack Shell. That's a story that I remember from, by heart growing up. It's amazing that I still remember it, but I remember it in all the details. And when I wrote it down, I shared it with some friends to get their feedback. And another friend said, oh, well, another friend from Ghana, she said, well, there's this story that I remember from childhood as well. And so... I mean, that just birthed the idea, why not, you know, look at all the different stories that came out of Africa and put them in the in a book format. I will say I also wanted something that could be shared easily. So with a book, my children could easily take them to daycare and share them with their teachers. It could be part of reading time. And so I suppose that's why I thought books. I will mm. also say that pre-pandemic, I was the TV, I was like super anti-TV So my children weren't doing much screen time. (laughs) So maybe books were just the obvious medium that came to Mm. mind. Yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, my sister-in-law is Nigerian and I went to school school in Malawi in Africa. So, yeah, so I've got a few ties into the continent. But a lot of people listening won't know much about Nigeria. So when you were growing up and hearing these stories, were you learning in English or or is English your second language? Oh, absolutely. In English. English is my first language. And for pretty much every Nigerian who goes through the education system, English is the first language. It's the language, is the national language of Nigeria. Interestingly, mm-hmm. we are surrounded, literally every country that borders Nigeria is French speaking. So like here in the US, Spanish is taught very popularly as a second language or a foreign language. Back home, French was that for us, but we all speak English fluently and then we have our native languages that we learn if we aren't living in those parts of the country or that we grow up with if we do live in the parts of the country that speak that language specifically. Yeah so that was why I was interested because you've also got these language learning books tell us about those as well. Sure so it's interesting how it all came about you know things don't quite follow a chronological order or the chronological order you had in your head. So from day one, I wanted to retell these different African folktales. 
And I thought to myself, well, if my children who are growing up as Americans can enjoy these stories, then all children who identify as American to any extent will enjoy them as well. But I think also any child who can read a story in English will enjoy these stories. And I kind of already had that fire burning. But then my sister-in-law came to me and she created something that I consider the Amazon for teaching our native Nigerian language to young children. So our language is Igbo and she created this brand called That Igbo Child. And she would just curate different charts, books and tools to help teach children in the diaspora our language Igbo. And so I said, hey, why don't we come up with a completely new product? You know, you have your wall charts or your flyers. You have storybooks, but what about a very simple board book that just has word image association? And that was how that was birthed. So it's kind of like in that brainstorming session, we decided to create a set of books. So each box has three books in it, one that translates body parts, one that translates animals, and one that translates things at home. And then on the back of our book, we have a link to our website where you can actually go for pronunciations. And that was a start, just our language. But then quickly we realized that we could expand this. So fast forward to today, we have 10 different African languages from Amharic, to in, which is in Ethiopia, to Swahili, which is the most popularly recognized African language in the world, all the way to smaller languages like Ewe, which is spoken in parts of Ghana and Togo. It's been a very exciting journey. <laughs> I think that's brilliant because you're sort of tapping into a culture you left for your children. Obviously, your parents left and took you as a child and trying to bring that to your children, but also much bigger. I love that you're looking at other African languages. That's fantastic. Oh, just a question about licensing. This model is reasonably new for you, but have you considered licensing those language books back into various countries in Africa or licensing books out of those African countries to distribute in the US? So I have not, I'll be honest, I'm kind of a one man show. So I have to really limit myself based on capacity. I do know that I have the copyrights to all these different products that I've put together. And I am toying with different ways to distribute them throughout the world. I actually do have distribution set up in the UK, Nigeria, Australia of all places, just starting in Canada. So in a few markets, but beyond that, everything is kind of in a backlog that I'm working through. Oh yeah. I mean, it's always like that, isn't it? (laughs) But it's interesting. You mentioned the UK, obviously we have a lot of diaspora Nigerians and a lot of other diaspora from other African countries here in the UK. So it's interesting, which is a very different culture to the US African American culture. But I mean, there's still a lot of people here who would share the desire to have their children speak Igbo, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Igbo, Yoruba, Hausa, we have all different kinds, we have Yoruba, all different kinds of languages. And what I find is that people are absolutely drawn to the packaging. So the first thing that I did, and again, remember, I was thinking of my children as I created this. So it was really great when I got our sample and I showed my children and they just wanted to open up the box and immediately find out and learn the content of these books. That was the validation for me. Like, okay, yes, this is hitting the target market. They're enjoying this. And it's a really great way to actually get them excited and interested in learning our language. So Again, mine is Igbo, but we have like Tree, which is a Ghanaian language, really great sellers. And I keep hearing the same feedback from different customers like, oh, my gosh, these are making it exciting for my children to learn. I'll also say I have adults who want to learn African languages. And so they buy those books as well because it's Mm. very simple. And then the other thing, I I completely assumed that the only people who would be interested in these books were diasporans, African diasporans. And I remember going to my children's daycare with my sample and kind of trying to pinpoint which parents I thought might be from this particular part of Africa that had the book, you know, where these languages came from. And my daycare director pulled me aside almost instantaneously. And she's like, oh, my gosh, we would love this in the daycare. You know, daycares in the United States have a mandate for diversity and also languages for children. And that was the first time that I realized that non-Africans actually would be interested in teaching their children a variety of different languages. So it's been interesting to see that the customer base is just unpredictable. You have those who really want to pass their languages on. 
And then you have those who want to broaden their horizons or the horizons of their children and go beyond Spanish or French or European languages and teach them African languages as well. It's exciting. Mm. Yeah, and I'm so glad you said that because, I mean, there's plenty of countries in the world. I'm thinking of Finland. So I worked in Finland for a bit and all the Finns speak English, like, because, Mm -hmm. but they also speak Finnish. But it's like Finnish would be another example of, I mean, there's a lot more people in Nigeria than there are in Finland, for example. I know Nigeria is a huge country and the African diaspora obviously is massive. But I think the languages that people learn are not necessarily related to their heritage. Absolutely. (laughs) It's like... We we all learn different things, right? We learn all kinds of different languages, even if there's a smaller group. I mean, obviously, something like Spanish is spoken a lot of places in the world. And I guess a lot of people learn the languages that are most common. So I learned French at school, but then I'm in England and I'm right next to France and we go on school trips and stuff. (laughs) But yeah, I'm glad you found that. That's great. Yeah. And I will say that Like I said, nothing really followed any sort of preset chronological order. I don't know that I ever imagined that these two book products would marry each other and create this entire suite of offerings. But it's interesting because my African folktale story books, those are in English. And when I was designing them, I was literally thinking, oh, this would absolutely be applicable to every single person in the United States because they're in English. But these are literally retellings of what I would call historical artifacts. These are stories that every child of African descent would have heard growing up all the time. If we think of stories from Disney or we think of stories from the Brothers Grimm, things along those lines, these are stories that to this day as adults we remember. And as I have children now, I'm telling them those stories as well. Well, I thought, wouldn't it be so awesome for us to also share our stories, not just with our children and kind of keep them insulated, but to share with the world and just have the world explore our African legacy through our stories. So I thought of those as two very different things, like African languages and then African stories. But I'm definitely seeing like a marriage of the two now. And I will say this on the back of each of my books. So each book is representing a story from a specific country in Africa. The goal is to tour the entire continent and have one story from each country. But on the back, I also have a geography lesson. So you get to learn about the country that the particular story came from. And then on the inside, I have, these are like the winning piece, I think. Every time I'm out in public and I introduce the books and I open this, people's eyes just light up. (laughs) But I have these culture cards and they talk about the culture and tradition of the people who brought the stories to us. So for example, my first story is an Ashanti story from Ghana, the Ashanti kingdom in Ghana. And on the inside, you have culture cards that teach you about the kente cloth, the Ashanti golden stool. And I'm now just kind of seeing a link between that and then my tree language books, which is this language that they speak in the Ashanti kingdom. And so I see a lot of people like buying the two products for their kids or for their friends. So it's a full cultural experience, our stories, our languages. And I mean, it's been a very exciting journey. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And I mean, like you mentioned about adults wanting that too, I can see you and also many children's authors as their children grow, they start doing books for the different ages when as the children grow, they start changing the types of products they do. So I think you've got a hell of a business on your hands there. But you've mentioned there that you were designing the book, that the packaging is really cool. So are you the artist as well as the writer? Or how did you find your illustration? And how did you do the design? Oh no, my talents go so far. So I am the writer and I use social media extensively to find illustrators. For the language books, I happen to connect with a Nigerian illustrator who is amazing. He literally designed the entire package. I pretty much just gave him the concept and he took it and ran. He drew all the images, designed the packaging, which is extremely popular with customers. And then for the storybooks, that was a completely different look and feel that I was going for. So I looked all over social media sites. I discovered Behance, or is it Behance, B-E-H-A-N-C-E. I was on Instagram, Upwork, Fiverr, all those sites. At the end of the day, the illustrators that I really um, thought captured what I was looking for, I found them on Instagram. And it was an interesting journey because on platforms like Upwork and Fiverr, there's a bit of a money back guarantee, if you will. 
So if, you know, you put money into this particular illustrator or service provider and they don't deliver the work, you have some sort of an assurance that you'll get your money back. Because at the end of the day, we don't know any of these people, right? They're complete strangers all across the world. So with Instagram, I was very nervous because I had to, I mean, I wasn't doing the work of transactioning, uh, transacting on that platform. So it was definitely a leap of faith, if you will, trying mm. to determine the best way to guarantee deliverables and things along those lines. But it ended up working out. Oh, that's fantastic. Because it does take time for people to find an illustrator but if you find someone who matches with you then that's great you want to hold on to them but another issue for children's books is printing costs the materials and say print on demand so how are you doing your publishing are you using like print on demand services like ingram spark how are you doing your distribution i have to be honest if i had thought this entire initiative out properly, I probably would never have started. (laughs) So I discovered (laughs) as I was going, and I'm grateful for that because here we are today. So for printing, I actually worked through Alibaba to find, I mean, that was an entire process on its own. I was vetting all kinds of printers, getting all different kinds of product samples. And fortunately, I was able to narrow down to one printer for my two different book products, and they're pretty different. So one is a box set of board books, The other one is a picture book, so art paper, hardback, and that ended up working out. Of course, so I already had a look that I wanted, right? For the storybooks, I wanted them to have pockets in the back where I would have those culture trading cards. And Ingram Sparks and your regular print on demand would not offer those customizations. So I felt like I had to go with my own private printing process, if you will. And that definitely requires a lot of upfront capital, but I really believe like that differentiator is worth the investment. And so that's how I'm doing it. I'm not print on demand, but the products, the quality is really, really good. And so I definitely wouldn't trade that at this point. Okay. So you found a printer through Alibaba, you're doing print runs, let's say, I don't know, 5,000 of a book. And then how you mentioned that you are distributing obviously in the US, but also UK, Australia, Canada. So how are you getting those printed books into places in those countries? So it's not very easy. And I'm just starting out as I speak to you. I think, I don't know if I mentioned this when I first reached out to you, I was brand new. So I'm just about a year in the entire game. And so I'm still figuring things out. In the US, it's really easy because I live here. So my home is my warehouse. And I have my books available on platforms on Etsy, on Amazon, on my website, of course, uh, things along those lines, but I distribute all of them. And then I'm now getting into the bigger box stores. So your Whole Foods and your Targets and things along those lines. But for those ones, I literally had to get a couple of middlemen to get into the stores. But at the same time, at the end of the day, I'm still delivering all these books to these warehouses and then they're being shipped to the different end locations. For the UK, Nigeria, Canada, and things along those lines, I am really relying on a network of personal relationships that I have with people for the most part. And I'm getting my books directly from China ship to their locations and then they are distributing on my behalf for now for for now well that's interesting and i mean sometimes we have people listening from different countries who have other connections so hopefully you might get some people reaching out because i feel like that person the way you're doing it and i i love that you're like a year into it and you're doing all this stuff <laughs> It's amazing. What I would challenge you on and would like to suggest is that perhaps you do, in addition to your special print ones, you also upload a version to, say, Ingram Spark as a print on demand book that, or and or Amazon KDP print, so that you can reach every other country in the world without mm. having to do all of that. Because even if they don't have that little pocket in the back it's like it's a 95% product or it's a 90% product which still communicates what you want to. Do you have ebook versions too? I don't, you know, so... and like Yeah, I said, that would be I'm another just, suggestion. Like, yeah, and I'm just trying to manage my capacity, honestly, because I'm still a mom and I still work full time, all those different things. So I'm, I did look into, I think I even tried to upload a version into Ingram Sparks at a point for that very same reason. 
I can't remember why I kind of abandoned ship. To be honest, if it was, if it had anything to do with reformatting and things along those lines, I was like, okay. Too much like hard work. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I do eventually want to transition into making sure that I can do that and reach all the different markets. But I'm also discovering that marketing is the largest piece of this because I created my books and I just thought, oh, everyone's going to just know about them. I have a few thousand people on my Instagram platform and Facebook. I'm going to just post this and everyone's going to see it and buy it. And I'm discovering now that Instagram doesn't show every one of your followers the posts that you do. So I'm having to pull back from all these different additional, I guess, processes or backlog items, as I call them. And I'm trying to learn the marketing aspect, like how do I actually get the word out there to create the demand for the books? And that's been a very exciting process in some ways. And I'm just kind of focusing market by market. So I'm very heavily focused in the U.S. right now because that's where I am. And so I can control that a little little bit. And then I'm trying to figure out how to expand that model to different markets. I love that you said that. And I know it's hard, but it's, I did exactly this back in 2008, seven, something like that. I printed a load of books. I had them in my living room and I thought, oh, I'm going to just sell them all in five minutes and make loads of money. It'll be <laughs> awesome. And then I was like, this, I've got this brilliant picture. I hope you've got one of these because there's a moment I stood in, I'm standing in front of these boxes looking so proud. And then, and the picture captures my face when I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> oh my God. I'm telling you, it is, it is something else, but I've discovered something in marketing right now. And it's really, and very literally direct to customer, I would say. So in addition to going to street fairs and things along those lines, I now do school readings. And I was talking a little bit about like the culture cards and the back, the geography lessons. My school readings are beyond an author talk and like the book read. I actually have an entire, what I call African storytelling reimagined program. So It's really cool because I bring with me clothing, instruments, our brooms, our calabashes. And for the entire session that I'm reading to children, sometimes I do a one hour session in school or I do a full day. Some schools book me for multiple days. Children get to just experience a day in the life back home in Africa. And with the focus on diversity these days and culture, this is just driving this really big demand. And what's amazing about the school readings is that they tell parents that I'm coming. And so parents now get to learn about what I'm doing, about my books. And so that's really taken off. Uh, But like I said, I'm just literally trying to discover (laughs) different ways to market these books. These ones are still very like in-person heavy. You know, I'm trying to think of the best way to market a picture book digitally. So I haven't cracked that nut yet, but I'm enjoying the school reads in, in the meantime. Mm, well, I absolutely recommend um, Karen Inglis's book. I'll send you some links afterwards. <laughs> but Karen Inglis has been on the show. And her book is in the second edition now. It's How to Self-Publish and Market a Book for Children or a Children's Book, something like that. And uh, Karen is doing incredibly well with digital marketing as well as with schools. So there's definitely ways to crack this. But it's definitely a challenge for children's authors because, of course, your market it's not actually the children, it's the parents, the librarians, the grandparents. So when you're, so you said you're doing Instagram and I know you have Facebook as well. How are you finding that? Or is it literally just the in-person stuff that's working? (sighs) I'll tell you. (laughs) Right before we got on this call, I was just trying to battle the Facebook, I don't know, help center. And Instagram is owned by Facebook or I guess Meta Meta now. So they're all one and the same. So one thing that I do, in addition to the school readings, I do a lot of library readings and I have a partnership with Nordstrom. So I'm traveling around the U.S. doing readings at Nordstrom. So what I've discovered that is working for me indirectly is boosting the ads to my Nordstrom reads. So, for example, I have one coming up in Dallas in a week and a half. So I just posted that and I put a boost. So that gets the attention of people digitally. They come to the reading they enjoy the session, they buy the books. So that's all I've really been able to do on social media for now, Facebook or Instagram. I find that when I do put an ad on Instagram or Facebook, it kind of plays throughout Instagram and Facebook because like I mentioned earlier, they're all part of the same company now. But when I do direct ads for my books, I'm not quite getting that traction. And again, I I think 
it's just difficult to differentiate yourself. Well, and I could be completely wrong, but to really differentiate myself as a picture book, like why buy this compared to the thousand other picture books that are on the market today? Like what's mm-hmm. different about this one? Why do I need to grab this? And I'm still trying to figure out the best way to capture that with the storybooks. When they see it in person, they get it because I show them the back. I show them the cards. They automatically love it. But digitally, it's a challenge. I will say for the language books, though, that's not as difficult when I market on social media, especially when I try to target those niche markets because they say, oh, this is my language. Oh, my gosh, this exists. I want it. So that translates a little bit differently. But again, I'm not quite there yet. It's still very in-person heavy. I I seem to be getting the message across in person. I'm open to tips. (laughs) Oh, well, what's so interesting, and I I love that you've come on and you're only a year in, and in five years' time, if we're still going, pitch me again. Because I I feel (laughs) like I've had people on here, obviously, who like Karen, who I mentioned. She's been doing children's book self-publishing for probably a decade and I've been doing this for almost 15 years and I feel like there's so much we learn and there's so many things I could tell you what to do or that Karen could tell you what to do but like you said if someone had told you you would never have started (laughs) but equally you're doing great you're doing amazing (laughs) thank you you know I hit my first thousand books sold as a first time self-published author in I think three months or so since publishing. So I know that the demand is there. I know that especially in this part of the world, the United States, diversity is a huge um, topic. Again, it's just figuring out how to market it digitally because what people see in person that gets them wanting copies of the books and telling people about it, I'm not able to translate in like one second of the Instagram attention span you have before they just determine if they're going to swipe or if they're going to stay on your page and actually listen. It's interesting because the first video I have on my Instagram page, it's pinned, is a video of me talking about the books. But again, to so that point, in one second or two seconds, people are making a decision whether to swipe or to sit down, turn the volume up and watch. So I'm constantly playing around with that. So I really want to check out Karen's book, her tips. For those of you who've been doing this for a decade plus, I mean, there's a lot that I could learn from that. Well, I love your attitude, but I did want to come back. You mentioned you're doing readings in Nordstrom, which is a department store, if people don't know. How did you get that? So uh, it's interesting when people ask me that question, because the answer is I just asked. (laughs) The same way I'm here on your podcast, the same way I've been able to get into schools, like hundreds of schools around the country, I just ask. And so I literally have a team that I work with. There are a bunch of other ladies based in Nigeria, but I set up a process just to reach out and ask these questions. And apparently Nordstrom is all about promoting small businesses that all, whose brands or whose missions align obviously with what it is they're doing. And they love the idea of the, the reading, the cultural aspect. Again, I'm really writing that because it's, it's needed and there is a huge appetite for that in this part of the world today. So I reached out, I told one Nordstrom about my books and I was actually asking if they would sell the books there, if they were willing to buy wholesale from me directly. But I think, as I mentioned at the very beginning of our session today, these department stores and the chains, they don't buy directly from the author. They have their distributor. So I have to literally, I have two different middlemen to get into these stores. Mm. So that was not an option, but they said, you know what, you can come and do a pop-up. And I said, well, in addition to a pop-up, why don't I share my culture in this way and do the readings? And they just love it. They love the idea. And before you knew it, here we are today. I've been in a ton of different Nordstrom's and I have a ton more to go this year and like no end in sight, really. (laughs) Great well, that's, that's great. I love that you ask. You mentioned this team in Nigeria. So is the, these freelancers that you're paying to email pitch or you said you just ask, but how are you asking? Yes. Yeah, so I started off, so my background, I should explain, is in process in operations and strategy professionally before becoming an author. And so I'm always thinking about processes and how to create things that can be repeatable and repeated by different people. So my first foray was to actually reach out, look into different schools or different retail centers or different places and ask if they would be interested in me doing a reading. I actually say, rewind a little bit. I published my first book in February and I thought to myself, that's Black History Month in the United States. I wonder if places that would have children there would be interested in me coming to do a reading. 
So I was pitching to indoor playgrounds because in February it's cold. Parents want their children to be indoors, but still playing. And so I created a little pitch message. And now I've expanded that a little bit more because I've gotten some media traction. So I've added those links on there. I've had successful story times at Nordstrom and school. So I can add some of those imagery to the emails. And I'm always tweaking it just a little bit to really help drive what it is that I'm doing. Because again, people have lots of different things coming their way. How do I get, grab their attention in the first line of my email? And now that I have that in place and I have a process of how to target the right customers, I just have a team who does that for me, repeats that task and does it for me. Mm. And their email and the, their signature line refers to you or that they're your team, basically. Absolutely. Yes. So all yeah. the responses come back to me and I can follow up from there. I think so, that's great. And what's so interesting with this in-person marketing, and I've heard that I don't do it much myself, but I've heard this from people who do what you're doing, which is department stores and schools, is you don't know who those parents are or who they or who those store customers are. There could be someone from a local radio station or someone from a TV thing or someone who does have a bigger in- Instagram channel or someone who's put puts your video on TikTok or, you know, there are lots of opportunities for in-person marketing that then turn into other forms of marketing. So I think what you're doing is great. And like you said, I mean, we're recording this in October 2022. And like you only published this year. So look, hats off to you. I don't think you realize how well you've done. I mean, I can tell that it's really hard, but you're doing really well. And I I guess that would be the question. Did you start this with a commitment to like a decade? Because that's the other thing. It takes time to compound into people actually knowing about you? Yeah. So initially, and like you said, I'm, I'm picturing the the picture, I'm, I'm the image of you standing it around these boxes of books. I thought I would print a thousand copies of each of my books and sell them in a week. <laughs> <laughs> and I also thought that the entire initiative from end to end would probably take like a thousand dollars maximum. So worst case scenario, I could just get these books out, no harm lost. And before you knew it, before I actually had books printed, I'd sunk in significantly more than that amount of money. So the driving force for me was, I need to make this money back. I need to put this back into the savings account that came from things along those lines. And so that spurred a lot of the creativity. For example, I started off just sending messages to my family and friends, putting it on Instagram. I found that wasn't working. So I started reaching out to indoor playgrounds. Then I discovered bookstores, some independent bookstores who would link me up to street fairs. And again, like you mentioned, at some of these in-person events, I've met one of the libraries that I'm working with now. I've been trying to get their attention and and I never could. But someone I met at one of those readings happens to be the decision maker at the library. So now here's the conversation we're having. So I'm really looking at those opportunities as ways to kind of get my name out there. But like I mentioned earlier with my storybooks, My goal, I have the map of Africa on the back of each book with the specific country that the story comes from shaded out. And my vision is to see like a collector's item, if you will, where by the end of the day, there's one book from each country. So we've shaded out every single country in Africa. So, I mean, with that in mind, and if I can write one book per year, I actually am currently illustrating my third book, which is coming out in February, 2023. That's a story from South Africa. If every year I could put out a new story from a new country in Africa, then I have a pretty decent pipeline, I'd say, of mm. of books, of stories. I love that. I've actually got in front of me, I have a map of the world, obviously, which includes Africa right in the middle. And I look at it every day. And when I was a kid growing up, we did a lot of traveling. And obviously, like I told you, we went to school in Malawi and, and we weren't allowed a TV. Well, when in Malawi, we didn't have TV. And when we moved back to England, my mum was like, we're not having a TV. So I had mm. this map of the world on the wall. Um, as a child and I would learn all the countries and all the capital cities that was like fun for me at the weekend I'm yeah. such a geek, you know and it's amazing although of course countries obviously change over time <laughs> what, right right what well, names think- of countries and things but I totally I think I love your vision I think it's brilliant and actually by the time you get to let's say number 10 or number 12, then you're going to be a lot further along in the process. And what you'll find is all those relationships will compound and things will 
they'll get difficult in a different way, I think, would be the, the thing. <laughs> I could only hope, I tell you, I could only hope. But also to go back to what you were just saying, that was kind of the vision that I had as well. Because I actually initially just wrote these stories and I thought, oh, these are cute stories to share with the world. But I thought, well, what an amazing way to introduce children to Africa, what Mm. Africa is, the different countries that exist in Africa. So I know that when I moved to America as a teenager, there were a lot of people who didn't realize that Nigeria was a country that was very different or far away from, say, Kenya, things along those lines. So if I could help this new generation, my children's generation, realize that Africa is this big continent with many different countries. And in all my school readings, we have those discussions. We talk about continents. We talk about the countries in Africa. Then what a great gift, right, to give to this Mm. next generation. That's my That's one of my hopes, my dreams. And today we're living in a world where it's important to raise global citizens. And so this is kind of like my my hope that this initiative that I'm doing can help to foster that, raising children who are global citizens and they're just a little bit more aware of the world around them. Even if they don't have passports quite yet. I never understand that about Americans. It's like it's one of the first things we get here, uh, especially after Brexit. We can't even go across the pond to France. But I love what you say. And also, I mean, I have lots of ideas. I mean, for your business as well, you could branch out much further than books. You could be importing things that you can turn into other products that link back to Nigeria and other African countries and that people will buy because they're related to your book. So you have a great idea here. I think it's fantastic. And yeah, I'm excited to see where this goes for you. But we're almost out of time. But I did just want to come back on, on your Facebook page, which I was having a look at. And you do say, I can't tell you how many times I question myself and wonder if I should quit. And you have have told us about some of the difficulties and that vision is a long-term vision but what else stops you quitting because I know that first year particularly is very hard very hard indeed and I try to be as open and transparent because as I'm discovering today and of course having been in the game for well over a decade it's not as easy as it looks people see me at Nordstrom and they just think oh my gosh she's you know it was probably easy or she must have been doing this for ages And I have other entrepreneurs who I've kind of been brainstorming with as we start out our journey. And I'm very passionate about being transparent. So I like to let people know that these are difficult things. Every single deal, this deal with Whole Foods, for example, has been in the work for significantly longer than I would have thought it would. Things along those lines. I love to share not just the highs, but also the lows. I don't think we see enough of that. And we come in thinking, as you and I did at the beginning, that, oh, this would just be a walk in the park. We'll sell all these books instantly. But I truly believe that this is what I'm meant to do. I'm deeply spiritual, and I don't believe that this is something that I just picked up out of nowhere. I feel like this is a calling that God put into my heart. And I just wake up every day refreshed, renewed. I'm learning to take a break instead of quitting. So when things get really challenging, when the juggling act just gets a bit overwhelming, I'm learning to just pause, take a step back, and then come back tomorrow, come back next week. In essence, take a vacation from the business. So I don't know, I'd say there's just this inner driving force that's keeping me going. And I'll also say, every time that I get a yes, <laughs> it's another like piece of validation that this is going the right way. So every time a school gets back to me, or a store gets back to me, or I see a sale on my website, or I get a comment or a review from someone who's bought my books or something along those lines, that just helps to fuel the flames. And I think that it doesn't take much when the fire is already burning so deeply inside of you to push you a little bit further. There are mm. all these different um, all these different hoops to jump through. Like you were mentioning earlier, I need to go ahead and get my stuff on print on demand and things along those lines. But I'm learning to just compartmentalize some of the more difficult ones and focus on what's going to bring me energy. And as that energy comes, I can build out teams to automate some of these processes. I can go back to some of those really difficult pieces and re-look at them with fresh eyes. Oh, I love that. And I think you've kind of re-energized me there. It's really, it's great. I mean, I know it's hard for you, but I remember all of this. And I can only hope that you can also look forward and see that. I'm a decade ahead of you and you can do this. I mean, obviously I have a very different business, but yeah, it sounds amazing. So tell people where they can find you and your books and everything you do online. 
Absolutely. My name is Ada Ari. My website is Ada, A-D-A hyphen A-R-I dot com. And my Instagram account is A-D-A underscore A-R-I. You can also find links to my Amazon page, my Facebook page, my YouTube channel. All of those things are on my website. So I'm in many places online. I need to get on Twitter and TikTok. But you know what? Those are some of the things that I'm going to just put to the back burner for now. (laughs) And you don't need to. I'm not doing TikTok. I've said, no, not happening. But yeah, we all find our places. But thank you so much, Ada. That was great. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate the platform. Thank you for having me. So I hope you enjoyed the discussion with Ada and that it's given you some different ideas about how to grow your author business, whether or not you write for children. As ever, let me know what you think about the show. Tweet me at The Creative Pen. Leave a comment on the show notes or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. And later this week, I have an interview, special extra interview in between episode with James Blatch on launching your book successfully. And then next Monday's show, I'm talking to crime author Rachel McLean about five steps to author success, how she changed her mindset, then deconstructed a genre in order to write books that readers wanted. And in the process, she won an award and substantially grew her author income. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.